This morning, I have the honor of welcoming Dr. Katherine Meeks with us um, here to St. Luke's. She has been here many, many times. She is a great friend of St. Luke's. Um, she is the executive director of the Absalom Jones Center for Racial Healing um, and uh, has worked really hard in this diocese and now nationwide um, to really engage the conversation about the work it takes to really uh, try and begin to come to a place of racial healing. Um, prior to her, uh, uh, the center's opening, she chaired its precursor, which was the beloved community, the Commission for Dismantling Racism for the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta. She is a sought after teacher, and workshop leader, um, and she brings four decades of experience to the work of transforming, dismantling racism in Atlanta. The core of her work has been with people who have been marginalized because of economic status, race, gender, or physical ability as they pursue liberation, justice, and access to resources that can help them lead to health, wellness, and a more abundant life. And this work grows out of her understanding of her call to the vocation as teacher, as well as her realization that all of humanity is one family which God desires to unite. Um, Catherine is a retired Cla Clara Carter Acree. Okay. A Cree, distinguished professor of sociocultural studies from Wesleyan College and founding executive director of the Lane Center for Community Engagement and Service, as well as a midwife to the soul of her students and workshop participants. I love that description. I love that. Um, she has spent many years sharing the insights that she gained uh, from her pursuits of the truth. She has had many great teachers, including her sons, the Bible, Jungian psychology, cross-cultural studies, stories, and other books of wisdom. But her greatest teacher is rheumatoid arthritis because, because it has forced her to learn many new ways to listen to her body and to pay attention to the messages from her heart. She is a frequent writer of the Huffington Post and is frequently asked to present commentaries on Georgia Public Radio. I have heard her several times. And other radio and television programs. She is the author of six books and one inspirational CD and holds a master's degree in social work from Clark uh, Atlanta University and a PhD from Emory. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm in good shape today because I spent all day yesterday in my nightgown watching movies. <laughs> and I don't get to do that very much. So uh, it's great to be here. And I want to say thank you to St. Luke's for your amazing support of the work that I've been doing in this diocese for the last six or seven years. And to one of our board members, LaFon Gilliam, who has been just a priceless gift to us, and many of you in this parish that have contributed in different ways to our work. If it were not for the uh, generosity of parishes like yours and you, we would not be able to do the work that we are doing. And we will continue to call upon you because the work has to be sustained. And the sustainability is going to be the results of everybody's contributing in whatever ways they can. So when I was asked to come and do this, the thing that I said I would talk about is racial healing because that's the thing that's on my mind, particularly since I am running a center for racial healing. It should, I should be thinking about that. So I want to ask you to uh, remember with me the, the scripture where Jesus is um, walking by the pool of Bethsaida and there's this crippled man lying on the side of the, the pool, and he complains to Jesus, 
that you, if you remember the story, that the story is that the angel comes to trouble the waters ever so often. And when that happens, if you can get into the water, you can be healed because the water becomes different from when the angel didn't trouble it. And so this man says to Jesus, the angel comes, but I haven't been able to get into the pool and nobody's helped me. And so he's lamenting his plight. And you know, if that were one of us that was being spoken to, we would join him in his commiseration of how everybody hasn't done what they should have done to help him. But instead, Jesus said to him, do you want to be healed? Which I think is, I, I read, I've read that scripture over and over for a long time, and then one day, it was like, as Howard Thurman says, the smell of ammonia hit me, and I saw it from a completely different, in a completely different way. Do you want to be healed? What a profound question. And how much every one of us has to embody that, that question in all different kinds of ways when we think about getting well. So I asked that question of my country in terms of racial healing, and I think the answer is no. This country does not want to be healed of the racial stuff that we have created here because in order to be well, we would have to reconstruct the way we do things here. And most folks are not ready for that reconstructive process, unfortunately. But then that's the collective question, the question to the country. There is also the need to ask the question individually. And as individuals ask that question, do I want to be healed? I think there are a couple of things to consider. If you are a white person, you have to be ready to confront the reality of the fact that this country was constructed upon an indefensible paradigm called white supremacy. And that every white person, no matter how poor you were, or how rich, or how anything, you are a benefactor of that construction. And every person of color, has to deal with the fact that having, having had to listen to the narratives that were created out of that supremacist notion that we took in some things that we needed to, to, that we have to deal with. The narrative of less than is in the virus of this country, is in the DNA of this country. And if you are a person of color, you have to deal with that reality. And you can't just, say, well, I'm liberated and it's not a problem, because it is, somebody will remind you that you don't have the right to be liberated if you are a person of color in America before the day is over, depending on where you happen to go. So dealing with the internalization of a narrative, of the master narrative of superiority, which is a false narrative, is something that I and other people of color black, brown, native, indigenous people have to deal with, have to acknowledge, if we want to be well. And then the real kicker comes for me as a person of color, particularly when I realized somewhere along the way that God actually created everybody. Because you know, I didn't actually want God to have made some people. <laughs> because it would have been easier for me to just wipe them off the slate and not deal with them. But come into terms with that everybody is made in God's image, and the worst part about that is that God loves everybody equally. I mean, that is the worst part. Because I, I know you've got your list just like I have of some people that you know God just cannot love as much as God loves you. Because you're just better than them. Well, I was driving my car somewhere, and I, re I was thinking about all this stuff way back, probably 50 years ago, because it was, I've been in Georgia 46, 47 years, and it was, I was in Georgia, so it was close to, it was, was, a lot, it was when I first got here. And I was, I was so struck by realizing that God loved Idi Amin and Lester Maddox. And those were two people I didn't want God to love. I didn't want God to make them, and I didn't want God to love them, and I wanted to be able to write them off and have nothing to do with them and not have, ever have to think about them. But if I want to be well, if I want to be well, I have to deal with that reality. 
as I have to deal with the reality that white people are unconscious too many times and don't get what has happened to me and people like me in this country because you look at me with my PhD from Emory and my books and my this and that and you think, as somebody wrote to me when I used to write for the newspaper and make it, why are you complaining? You've, you've, you're doing fine. All I have to do is drive a few miles in this state for somebody to call me a nigger. I don't have to go far to treat me as if I am less than. All I have to do is go present my black body and face somewhere to be denigrated in America in this present moment. So I hold the reality of being this person, this empowered, beautiful, smart, um, accomplished woman, I hold that reality with the reality of walking around in a black skin is a dangerous enterprise. As a matter of fact, one comedian said that a black person is, is in the greatest danger in the minds of, a white peop of white people. We see that played out in the police killings in this country because young black and brown people get killed and questions get asked later because of the image of the dangerous black person. So white people have to deal with that stuff. That we can't, black folks can't fix it for you. You have to figure it out yourself. You know, when, a lot of times I speak all over the country and I speak mostly to Episcopal groups and many of them are mostly white. And they lament, we don't have any people of color. And I'd say, well, you know what? You can't fix that today, because you can't go rent them. You know, if they're not, if you haven't built your life in a way, if you haven't constructed your life in a way so that you have diversity in your life, you then just have to deal with the reality of your life being what it is. But you do not have to have people of color in your midst to do your work, to get well, to answer that question, yes and then to see what else God will say to you to do. Now, proximity to difference is an important thing to achieve as best you can. But you do not have to, you cannot let yourself believe the tale that you have to wait until there's diversity so you can start to work. That's not so. That, to, to answer that question that way is to be like the guy lying by the pool saying somebody needs to help me. And Jesus is saying, if you decide you want to be well, you'll figure out how to help yourself. You know, in 30 years, he probably could have slung himself into the pool. He could have rolled into the pool. There are many kinds of ways he could have gotten into the pool. So what is it? So what do you do with this, this history? Rabbi Abraham Heschel says that in a democratic society, some of us are guilty of some stuff but every one of us is responsible. Every one of us is responsible. You, may, you do not need, if you are white, you do not need to take on the burden of trying to be guilty because before you were ever brought to this earth, somebody constructed an indefensible system of superiority. But now that you're here and you know what that system is, you are responsible. Not guilty, responsible. And taking responsibility is so much more enlivening than deciding to be guilty. Guilt is basically a cop-out, I think, anyway, because you can use up all your energy just feeling bad. And when you get done, the situation is exactly the same as it was when you started being guilty. So someone said that, I was just in Florida on Monday talking, and someone said, you know, she felt so guilty, and I said, well, it's your choice, you can feel however you like, but let me tell you, it's a waste of time. And that people of color would wish for white people to get over their guilt and get busy using their resources to do something about deconstructing this indefensible system of supremacy. Because if you hang on to guilt, you don't have to act, because you think you've acted. I mean, because it takes a lot of energy 
And at the end of the day, if you're tired, you think you've done something. Have you had some of those days where you just twittered it away and you were so tired at the end of it and when you look back at what you did, it was nothing. You just twittered that day away. That's what guilt does. And I and other people of color have to give over, get over the, the temptation to be a victim. We cannot use our energy being victims. Now, when you have been beaten down and beaten down, and the, socio, the, the socio-cultural structures are set in place to keep you in your place, it is very difficult not to see yourself as a victim. So we have a responsibility to work on building new ways for, for people of color to, to realize they can be healthy, whole human beings and that they don't have to be victims. On Friday, someone said something to me that was so disturbing. I was talking to an African-American woman about rock, young folks, p- people breaking into houses and doing criminal stuff. And so she said to me that this police officer, whom I assumed was African-American, I did not ask her, said, cause she was telling me a story about some young guys who was stealing a computer and television set from somebody's house. And she said to me, the police officer said, we're just gonna have to put some lead in these young people. We're gonna have to kill young black and brown people because young black and brown people are disenfranchised by a system that has no interest in them, by educational systems that are poised against them, by a criminal justice system or not justice, criminal legal system that is designed to swallow them up. And our response is we need to kill them, we need to shoot them. My good friend, Dr. Gail Christopher, who does amazing work around this whole issue of racial healing, says that one of the greatest, greatest tragedies for people, brown and black people, that has come out of the supremacist model is that we don't know how to love each other. It has, we have bought the narrative the narrative of less than, and then we project it onto other people. Oh, we, we're careful to pick the right group of people, you know, as we're gonna pick the kids that are dropping out of school or the people that are in prison or the kids that are stealing. Now, I, don't, I want you to be clear. I don't think that stealing from somebody is a good idea. I don't think that's a good idea. But I cannot sit on my throne of achievement and not understand the system that has made it necessary for young people of color to the world. And we get on our high horse and start passing judgment and deciding, you know, the, this, who, these are the folks that are responsible. The, fi- the families are responsible. The families are responsible and there are many good black and brown families in this country but the black and brown family has been under assault in this country since the very beginning. And if there are strong black families and brown families, it's because they have survived in spite of the system's intention to destroy them. So, how do you become a compassionate person who really is trying to be well? How do you as a white person look at the reality of this country and allow God to get you beyond the ego's desire to protect itself and to keep the structures in place and to make sure the status quo, that the boat doesn't get rocked too hard because you don't want the status quo to be changed too much. And how do we who are black and brown, who have been allowed to have a little bit of, little piece of the supremacist system have been allowed a union card. You know, we used to laugh about our PhD was our union card into academia. Education is a union card into the white supremacist paradigm. If you manage to get it, then you've got a union card. So you've got a little bit of delegated power. How do we decide that being well is more important than being safe and stable and white and accepted black person or brown person. In South Africa, they used to give black people honorary white status. 
So if you were the, the right black person, they let you be treated as if you were white. And they called it being honorary, you were honorarily white. Well, we do the same thing, we just don't call it that. We have the black folks that we like to have around because, you know, there's, there's a handful of us, there's a, there's a few of us that's gonna make it through the ceiling and we're gonna get to be whatever. And then we have to be careful that when we make it through the ceiling, that we don't become protectors of the system that's disenfranchising all of our sisters and brothers. So it is a challenge to decide to be well, and it is a challenge that never goes away. That you don't, it's not like you get done with it. It's about a whole lifetime. Answer, asking and answering that question for a whole lifetime. Do I want to be well? And then if the answer is yes, the work is ongoing. It is about spiritual formation. If you want to be a healthy Christian, you know, we haven't been told much about how racial healing is important if you want to be a, a, a good Christian. We think that we've, we've been told that you need to go do this workshop, read this book, do this activity, check off the box and you're done. Well, I'm here to say that, the, that racial healing which is just one part of the oppression construct because any kinds of notions of superiority about any group of people is the same thing, whether it's about race or whether it's about LGBT people, whether it's about people with lip physical limitations or whatever, it's all the same thing. Putting, here's a hierarchy and we're up here and they're down there. And, if, and we all have the propensity to have somebody that we want to be just a little bit above. I mean, it's just something about us. You know, if everybody failed the English test, you just want to know that somebody made a grade lower than you. You know, you don't care, you, everybody fails, so you don't care, but somebody's grade needed to be lower than yours so you could feel better about how you failed. Right? I mean, I, I didn't make that up. I, I know that. I taught school for 35 years, so, and I know for myself, you know, well, I didn't do quite as bad as so-and-so, so that makes it a little bit better. Well, God put us here to do something. God had a notion about who we were to be when we came here. God, Howard Thurman says that before we were born, God puts his imprimatur on us, God's mark for me that makes me different from every other soul that gets sent to the earth. God has something for me to do, something for you to do. And what you have to do is not what I have to do in order to be what God wants me to be and what God wants you to be. And what God does not want us to be is people who are deciding that some of us are better than others of us. That is not a part of any construct that you can find in the Bible. And wherever people were acting like that, if there's stories in the Bible where people are acting like that, they're not doing what God said. They're off on their own stuff the same way as we get off on ours. So what does it mean to be well for you sitting in this room this day on this lovely day that feels like spring is coming? I don't know, it could be snowing tomorrow, but right now it's not. So. So what, what, is the, what is the challenge to you? White, black, brown, I don't know what all the groups are that are in here, but what, what would it mean to you to say yes to that question at even a deeper level than you've already said? Oh, I know, I'm talking to folks at St. Luke. You all are progressive people. I get it. I get that. You're progressive. You do wonderful stuff. I get it but you're not done. You are not done. Your church is too white for you to be done. Your church is too much like, you too much like each other for you to be done. That's not to be guilty, that is to be responsible. To say, there's work to do, there's always work to do. There's gonna be work to do when we all die. When every one of us, if we work as hard as we can, from now until we die, there'll still be work left to do. So it's not about getting it done, it's about being faithful every day. What does it mean for me to be well, Lord? Help me to hear the answer. Help me to have the courage to do it. I wanna read you a quick little poem, and then I wanna, I'm gonna stop because I, I wanna hear 
questions and comments from you. But the, there's all the, the conflict. There's always the conflict. You know, Jesus is so always talking in paradoxes. The, the Christian faith, living on the earth, it's all a whole bunch of paradoxes. There's this thing right here that's wonderful, and this thing right here that's not so wonderful, and you got to learn how to hold them together. So I hate paradoxes, but that's the way life is, you know? You do something good over here, and then if you're not careful, it hurts something over here. And you got to pay attention, and you got to balance it, and you got to figure out how to do it, and live in the tension of those paradoxes. The reason why most people want to just set up categories and live in those categories is because living in the tension of the paradoxes is a lot harder than just saying, you know, all Latinos are this way. So now I don't have to think about the individual people that I meet because I've already made my box and put everybody in it. White folks who say, you know, they all black, we, we laugh in the black community about white folks think we all look alike. Because so many times you get called somebody else, you know, I go somewhere and somebody said, well, you were here so-and-so time, and I, I've never been in that town. But somebody there that was supposed to look like me, when I saw the person, I thought, they don't look like me at all. You know, I don't know how I got mixed up with that person, because they don't look like me. Here's the paradox. It's called Second Life, and it's a poem from David White. Who, the book is called Pilgrim. David White's an English-Irish poet and one of my favorite poets that I hope we will be bringing to Atlanta at some point because I so think he has so much to say to us. My uncourageous life, that's us, my uncourageous life, doesn't want to go, doesn't want to speak, doesn't want to carry on, wants to make its way through stealth, wants to assume the strange and dubious honor of not being heard. My uncourageous life doesn't want to move, doesn't even want to stir, wants to inhabit a difficult form of stillness, to pull everything into the silence where the throat strains but gives no voice. My uncourageous life wants to stop the whole world and keep it stopped, not only for itself, but for everyone and everything it knows, refusing to stir a single inch until, until given an exact and final destination. This uncourageous life, second life, this uncourageous second life wants to win some undeserved lottery so that it can finally bestow a just and final reward upon itself. No, this second life never wants to write or speak or cook or set the table or welcome guests or sit up talking with a stranger who might accidentally set us traveling again. This second life doesn't want to leave the house, doesn't want to take any path, that works its own sweet way through mountains, doesn't want to follow the beckoning flow of a distant river, nor meet the chance weather, where a pass takes us from one discovered world to another. This second life just wants to lie down, close its eyes, and tell God it has a headache. <laughs> but my other life, my first life, paradox, my first life, the life I admire and want to follow looks on and listens with some wonder and even extends a reassuring hand for the one holding back, knowing there can be no real confrontation without the need to turn away and go back away from it all to have things be different and to close our eyes until they are different. No, this hidden, this first courageous life seems to speak from the silence and in the language of a knowing, beautiful heartbreak, above all, it seems to know well enough it will have to give back everything received in any form and even sometimes as it, as it tells the story of the way ahead, laughs out loud in that knowledge. This first life seems sure and steadfast in knowing it will come across the help it needs at every crucial place, and thus continually sharpens my sense of impending revelation. This first courageous life, in fact, has already gone ahead, has nowhere to go except out the door, into the clear air of morning, taking me with it, nothing to do except to breathe while it can, no way to travel but with that familiar pilgrim movement in the body nothing to teach except to show me on the long road how we sometimes 
like to walk alone, open to the silent revelation, and then stop and gather and share everything, a dark, everything as dark comes in, telling the story of a day's accidental beauty. And perhaps most intriguingly and most poignantly and most fearfully of all, and at the very end of the long road it has traveled, it wants me to take to a high place from which to see with a view looking back on the way we took to get there. So it can have me understand myself as witness and thus bequeath me the way ahead so it can teach me how to invent my own disappearance. So it can lie down at the end and show me, even against my will, how to undo myself, how to surpass myself, how to find a way to die of generosity. Amen. So I will be happy to hear your questions or thoughts. I think we have about 20 minutes that we can do that. And I think conversation is always preferable to somebody just talking. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Um, they're always well-founded and um, all the way up to my mouth, okay. Thank you for your comments. Um, one of the things that I find is very puzzling about all this is the question of distribution of wealth. And, <clears throat> you know, there's lots of things we can do to improve our relationships uh, with each other, with black people. Uh, higher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to eat this thing. Um, <laughs> so, um, and, you know, because of the advantages we've had, white people have been able to accumulate uh, more money than black people have. And so there's the issue of reparations and other issues <clears throat> which get to be extremely, I mean, you want me to give up my money? You know, that kind of question. So do you have any comments on that? Well, you know, I think one of the best, what, there's a lot of conversation about reparations and, the, and people always go to, I'm black, you white, give me your money. Well, that's absurd. That's not going to happen. But there are ways to do reparations so that you start building new systems for equity so that you're, you're sort of fixing the mess that we made. Like, like some of the universities that, like Georgetown, because they were built on the backs of slavery, because it was built on the backs of slavery, it is now letting descendants of slaves come there for free. That's a reparation, as, as I see it. And that's the kind of way that some equity can be achieved, I think. I, think it'll, I don't know if there'll ever be any time it's real complete equity, you know. But there's so many things we can start doing, like paying people right, because there's still that kind of stuff that's going on. So we have a long ways to go before we get to you got to write me a check because I'm black or brown, you know. That, because that then is, an, is another way to play a game and not try to figure out what you can really do, because you know you're not going to do that. I mean, nobody in here is going to, nobody's dumb enough to think you're just going to go stand on the street corner and hand out money to folks because they're black and brown because we had slavery. That's not going to happen. And I, I get weary of people who love to have conversations about nonsense. The real sense is, look at what can we do. And we can, there are so many things that can happen starting tomorrow. You know, we can start with deconstructing some of the ways that inequities have been institutionalized. And, and when, you know, uh, black and brown people try to go to the bank and get money, the standard is different for us than it is for white people. Those are places where you can start doing something to, to level the playing field that, that people don't want to pay attention to. So if there are any bankers in here, go find out how they handle people of color when they come to, get, to make a loan. You can do that. And you can do something about it. It's not like... It's not like rocket science, you know, you can actually make sure, go through those loan applications and see who got money and who didn't, and if there were uh, comparable things there and somebody didn't get money, ask questions about it. That's reparations in my mind. And make sure education, we can do so much about education. And, and you know, I mean, the list is pretty long, and for me, it's pretty simple. It's just a matter of deciding do we want to do it. 
a whole bunch of stuff we could fix in America if we ever decided we cared enough about it to do it. And, and so, I, you know, I don't know when we'll get to that day, but so yeah, I don't, you know, I don't expect white people to give black folks money. I expect white people to work for the system to repay and repair some of that stuff that's been done historically. And for me, that's reparations. Uh, the most powerful thing that I've seen or heard from you is, uh, do I want to be healed? Mm -hmm. And uh, what this brings to mind to me is the whole area of addiction. And it seems to me in all addiction counseling, the first choice that has to be made is, do I want to be healed? Mm -hmm. Do I want to give up this addiction? Mm -hmm. But in looking back over a lot of experiences, I feel as if being white is an addiction. I'm addicted to my experience of being a white person. And I've got to ask myself, do I really want to be healed badly enough so that I'm going to give up this addiction, so that I'm going to do what needs to be done to make that happen? And, and so many of the other things that you've mentioned too, I'm, I'm looking at now as being addictions in personal relationships, uh, in, in married relationships. I'm addicted to my particular position and I don't want to give it up. But I've got to decide maybe more about how do we get to that point of wanting to be healed. Well, my friend Jim Wallace says white people have to decide that they want to be well, that being well is more important than being white. So, you know, like you, I'm sorry? Jim Wallace, my friend up at Sojourners, says that white people have to decide if being well is more important to them than being white. And, and the power that goes with the white skin privilege. You know, so I think, I think it is a very personal uh, journey to come to, the, to answer the question that says, I'm willing to give up some stuff here in order to be well. I'm willing not to hold on to this notion that somehow I'm, I'm in charge of everything and I'm supreme and I deserve everything to be the way I think it should be because my skin is white. But first of all, I think white people have to accept that that is a fact, the case, because there are a lot of white folks who are still trying to argue they don't have any privilege. You know, so let me tell you that it's your skin that gives you the privilege, not whether you were born, you could have been born in, a, in the woods in Appalachia, white, and you were in better shape there than a person of color. So it's because of the way the system, the, the country is constructed. So when you just accept that your skin gives you privilege, you know, you didn't have anything to do with it. I don't think they negotiated with you in some realm of the universe about whether you were going to come here as a white person or whatever. I don't know. Maybe that does happen, but I, I don't know who can tell me if it does or doesn't. So since you got here as you are, you just have to say, you know, I look at myself, I am this black woman that got sent to the earth for some reason, and I, there's nothing I can do about that. That is a fact that I have to live into the truth of. So I can spend my life lamenting that I got here as a black woman, or I can spend my life saying, God, what do you want me to do? And how am I supposed to live? And what is the, what, 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 what's the purpose for me to be on the earth? So. And to go back to addictions, you know, that's a very, I mean, your point, I don't know what else to say about that, except nobody gets well of an addiction until they decide they want to be well. How many times have we tried to help somebody get over an addiction by giving them this help and that help and some other help? And it was like throwing water on a, just throwing your money in the air, setting it on fire, until one day they woke up and said, I don't want to be this way anymore. So until white people in America say, ah, yeah, I've got white skin privilege, let me see what I can do with that. How can I fix that? You know, when I, I worked in the mayor's office in Macon, Georgia for a while, and the fact that I was Dr. Catherine Meeks calling on the behalf of some poor, illiterate person in the city to get things done for them made a difference. So I could have spent my time sitting around wringing my hands about, oh, I got this PhD and my sister didn't graduate from college and 
you know, wringing my hands and being, uh, uh, which is really kind of an ego trip anyway, instead of saying, I got this degree, let me use it. Let me use this degree, because when Dr. Meeks calls, there's a different response from when Jane Doe calls. So instead of me lamenting, let me be grateful that I had the resources, the opportunity to get this stuff now that I use for the benefit of people who, don't have, who didn't have that opportunity, who couldn't take advantage of it. I don't spend one minute having survivor's guilt because I have a PhD, you know, because it's good for making life better for myself and my sisters and brothers who didn't get one. And that's what white skin is about. You've got white skin, we set up this crazy mess here. Use your skin privilege to fix the mess instead of lamenting about or trying to prove you don't have privilege. Because I've had, you know, I've, I've done a, a gazillion dismantling racism trainings in this diocese and across this country. And every training, somebody holds up their hands to say, I don't have, I don't have any privilege. And I'm just thinking, can we just get past that? Do, do, you, do you look in the mirror? Do you see what color you are? Do you know how this country is constructed? It's not even worth arguing about. It's just a fact. And, and it's fine. Nobody wants you to turn purple. You know, stay who you are. Affirm who you are. Use your power. And if you feel disempowered, go find some friends and talk to them. Because together, you can, you can use your white skin to do something. You know, I can use my education, I use my empowerment every day, not only for my good, but for the good of people who, uh, the poet Rene, Ray, um, Rene uh, oh gosh, I can't think of his last name, just, just this minute, but he talks about, he has a lovely line and a poem that talks about speaking for the mouths that have no voice. You know, speaking for the mouths that have no voice. So think about that. I mean, think about how much we can use. All of us in this room have a sphere of influence, every one of us. And we have to decide if we want to be well enough to make that mean something, or if we want to kind of be addicted to um, trying to be disempowered. I think you can be addicted to anything. You can get to the point where you let something else determine your way of being in the world instead of being determined, letting your way of being in the world be determined by some deep inner core that's pushing you in the direction, not that I want you to go, but that God wants you to go. You have to ask yourself, what is it that God's calling me to? Not what I'm calling you to. Because what I'm called to is not what you're called to, but you're called to be authentic. And, you, and we're all called to make this world a place where people can live in peace and in harmony and have the basic resources they need to live their lives. Nobody's off the hook for that, not a soul. And so it's not like I can sit back and say, well, you know, those folks should have, they should have gone on to school. Well, maybe they should have, but they didn't. And, the, and that's not my problem, what should. My problem is what I see now and what is God asking me to do. So someone else, we have a little more time. I'll try to be brief. I'm very emotional. <laughs> My heart is pounding. Well, um, anyway, <laughs> what I want to say is that every day I'm aware of the color of my skin because we've adopted a black child. And um, it was not my intention, it's not what I wanted to do, it's not my life plan. I'm 52 years old, I did not want to have a baby. But my son wanted to foster who's 15, 14 at the time, and um, we decided to go ahead and foster. <clears throat> we, we didn't choose who we got. We got a newborn, um, and she stayed with us. <laughs> and eventually, her mother decided to sign away her parental rights to us. Um, and uh, it's been very confusing to me as a white woman. Um, and because of our response, the response, and I hate this one, is you're doing such a good thing for this child. Yeah. And it embarrasses me, and I think, you know, what she's done is such a great thing for us because the response I get from the world, and I don't feel sorry for myself in any way, this is, mm -hmm. 
This is me just emotional. I do not feel sorry for myself in any way. But I did not choose this experience. And um, it makes me aware of the color of my skin. And I realized I was never aware of the color of my skin. I didn't think about it. And, and the other Sunday, I was sitting in here, and there was a, um, a sermon. And I thought, God, I'm so tired. And I thought, God, I just don't want to think about this stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, you want to escape thinking about this stuff. And maybe you have the opportunity to escape thinking about this stuff. And all of a sudden, a light bulb went off. And light bulbs have been going off left and right. (laughs) My son goes to a um, free and reduced school, um, free and reduced lunch school. We live in a community where we're in this. And I want to say everybody move where we are. So you get to experience. So you get to see firsthand but I don't get to escape it. And I'm grateful for that experience, Um, but it is confusing. (laughs) But I'm grateful. Okay, I'll shut up. (laughs) Um, Given the uptick in hate and in racial division in this country, what gives you hope that healing is possible at all? Could you say it one more time? Given the uptick of racial division in this country, as we see it today, what gives you hope that healing is possible at all? Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, let me just say that I don't think anything's changed in America since 2016. I think that we were, we're right where we were before. I think in 2015, 2014, when Barack Obama was president, that America was exactly the way it is now in terms of the hatred and stuff, but there was less of an invitation for people to act out. And so now that people feel emboldened, folks who used to would have thought they needed to keep their mouths closed think they can speak out now. I don't think we got any worse. I just think we've been invited to, you know, in this kind of crazy, uh, let's tell the truth and let's be, let's be open and upfront people are acting out in a different way. So, but I cannot ever give up on the hope that God is still more powerful than darkness. And so it's the darkness that's running around now, making us look, do the stuff that we would have been doing if we'd been invited into that pool of darkness before. So I believe that God is stronger than the darkness that's running around. And that this is not God's way. And anything that's not God's way cannot be sustained. So this foolishness that's going on now with people thinking that they can just say anything and do anything, it's gonna get dealt with because that's not God's way. And it's up to people like us in this room to help make sure that that does happen. So that, what gives me hope is that God's still alive. Because if you look at the external world, you, I mean, you'd have to be kind of dumb to think that, that there's any chance that, that black and brown and white people can get together, Ex, just looking at the externals. But looking at it from the perspective of the great, amazing grace of God, I believe that we can, we can do something. You know, and I don't know what it'll look like, and I don't know how, what's going to happen between now and then. We may actually have another civil war in this country before we get there at the rate we're going. So I don't know about that part. But one time Frederick Douglass was speaking, and he was lamenting, because, you know, in Frederick Douglass's time, things were pretty bad, actually. And he was speaking about how bad everything was. And in the back of the room, that mighty woman, Sojourner Truth, stood up and said, Frederick, is God dead? And if God is not dead, there's hope. So that's, that's, I'm with Sojourner. We are, we are actually at time, um, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to us about the upcoming Lent conversation. Oh, okay. I'm sorry for the, I'll talk to you afterwards. Um, I'm going to be here starting whenever Lent is. I don't know when that's, when it, the 10th, is it the 10th? Um, we'll be reading together James Cone's The Cross and the Lynching Tree. 
and it's a very amazingly wonderful book. And James Cone is just an, a fantastic writer and soul. So reading his book will be good. We'll be reading it together. I, don't, I will not be coming trying to be an expert. We will read the book together and we will engage it together and be engaged by it together because I think that's how, you, how this work has to be done. There, there are no experts. We're all uh, wounded healers trying to figure out how to get to the bandage closet. So I'm delighted that it's four, five weeks, I guess, five Sunday afternoons, and we'll be alternating between here and All Saints. And also want to invite all of you tomorrow night to the Center for Racial Healing. The Clark Atlanta University Choir is doing a concert of remembrance, which will remember, some of you know this already, but we placed a marker on our property that remembers the 600 plus folks who were lynched in Georgia, and the choir will be remembering and honoring those people and also remembering that this year is the 400th anniversary of the selling of the first black folks were sold into slavery in the United States. And so we are commemorating that anniversary and the, the choir master has put together this marvelous concert that starts at 6.30. And I would really love it if any and all of you could show up for, for that. We would be delighted to have you. God bless you.